Right, let's get this thing started. We'll get others uh, coming in, I'm sure. We're seeing a number increase as well. Um, thank you, everybody that's already in here. This is a Qualified the Podcast, uh, IG Live uh, episode with myself, Hassan Hilliard, as well as Dr. Stephen Bond. Um, and as talked about uh, over the line, we were going to discuss education, uh, education in Black America, him being a Black educator, as well as the particulars of operating within the pandemic, uh, the book that was written, Perseverance in a Strange Land, Stay Home, uh, which was pretty good, you know, and not pretty good, very good in terms of providing perspectives on what the student went through um, during the pandemic, as well as, of course, through the incidents of uh, George Floyd and police brutality in general. I thought it was very interesting that you covered those two uh, segments in particular. I do have some questions about your viewpoint in being an educator during the pandemic. Um, so, you know, for that, we're going to speak for a while. Um, we'll be doing this from about 6 p.m., 7 p.m. Central Standard. For everyone else uh, on the East Coast, that's going to be 7 to 8 for you guys. Um, so let's just get started. Now, since um, we're blending audiences, and my audience um, may have some familiarity with you, but could you give a little bit of a background for yourself and you know how you got started in education? Sure. My name is Dr. Stephen Bond, and I've been in education now for 22 years. Uh, originally, my first year teaching was actually in Queens, New York. And I migrated to Florida for about 10 years. And then after uh, one of my family members died, which my mom and others, I moved to North Carolina about 10 years ago. And I've been teaching here ever since. And I love it. Um, I teach social studies, American history, AP history, AP government. Um, and years ago, I taught middle school in Florida. So I taught like civics and government, taught geography, and taught American history and world history. And what's cool, I have a lot of uh, followers who are my students or former students from years ago, and I would shout all of them out if I taught before or teach you now. And I uh, have some friends from the UK that's also watching as well, um, Dr. Um, Angelique Sweeney and her, and her father. So I see a lot of followers from the UK, and good morning, everybody. Kind of right now, the UK is midnight, so thank you for being on. That means a lot to me. So mm -hmm. I've been in education for 22 years. I love it. Um, it's evolved a lot since I've been in it. And you hit the nail on the point, teaching during the pandemic is different uh, for the teach perspective and for the students. Uh, one thing I've learned is really to hear the students more, hear the voices more, not that you didn't before, but understand that kids persevering went through a lot, just like I chose the time my book perseverance, kids went through a lot, socially, emotionally, you know, I had some, I had some students who lost their family members, lost their parents, lost their loved ones, and those who know me, who I taught, they know that I went through with the pandemic. I lost my twin sister. And my father was not related to COVID. Um, my dad dementia and my sister had heart failure. So I really could relate to what the students going through because to lose a family member or a parent during pandemic was traumatizing. Yeah. And so one of the things I've learned is really to listen to students more, see what their needs are, and also give those students a time to vent. And journal, which I've always done for years, I've always had my students journal. But I did it more, and you know, this time I had it published. But I've always been a teacher where I want to hear the kids' perspective on stuff. You know, are they upset what's going on in the world? What's going on in America with school shootings? Is there a fear, the anxiety? You know, what's going on in Buffalo? You know, it's real. Yeah. And so the mental health of teachers and st students, it's a lot. Teachers I know have dealt with anxiety attacks, being depressed. I have had students come to me personally because students will come to the teacher that they know they can confide with. They'll say, no, I'm stressed. My mom's a nurse and, you know, I really can't, you know, hug her because I may get COVID. I'd be careful where I go. You know, it's different where, you know, using school, you go to school, you know, you go to prom, different events, and all I was taken away. So really understood that students need to vet and that social and emotional needs had to be met. And teachers as well, because, you know, some people just expect teachers just to do their job. Like, this didn't affect them emotionally. You know, lose my dad, lose my twin sister, with three months span was hurtful for me. And there were times when I heard the students betting and I could talk and really, we were kind of released to each other and vented to each other. And so that was the beauty part of it. You know, and I'm, and I'm blessed for it as well because they suffered, but so did teachers. Yeah. And so 
that's just been my teaching career. So for 22 years, I love teaching history. I believe in making history dramatic. You know, you see me, I've dressed up. <laughs> I've done different role plays. And now because social media, you can do TikTok and other stuff. And it's funny because I hated TikTok. You know, my first TikTok no, I, was like. Say, stay on that for a second. So. Okay. What, what you've done so far, if, if so, we can have this as a pretty linear conversation. What you've done so far is, A, you are an educator for 20 plus years. Um, also, you've published this book. Aside from that, and actually how our conversation started initially, was that you were doing more of the role play and, and inspiration in terms of uh, getting the students to understand the Constitution. You were doing that in a pretty interesting way. So I wanted to highlight that separately because, FYI, this, this goes out. When, when we do record this, it's not just for IG Live. This is actually going to be on all streaming platforms as well as we'll just post the video on YouTube for, the, uh, for that stream. And people need context because if mm. they weren't aware of what you were doing, what's taken off so much on TikTok was that you were dressing more parliamentarian uh, and, and getting them to understand um, amendments of the Constitution. And by them, I'm talking about our youth. Um, our our mm -hmm. children, our children of color, our black youth, and for those that are attendants in your particular school. But can you clarify with me just so that I, I can further appreciate this? What what is the name of the school? So it is it's what is Wilson Preparatory? Oh, yes, Wilson Preparatory Academy. Yes, sir. Uh huh. Where is that particularly located, though? It's in Wilson, North Carolina. Wilson, North Carolina. Okay, so the student body uh, in terms of minority. Um, minority population how many are in that student body i would say it's probably about 70 percent minority and 20 percent white and 10 percent you know spanish and other about that demographic mm -hmm. okay so so i'm not trying to create a narrative with that but i am trying to bring up a point is that if you're able to inspire and encourage youth who typically would not have interest or even intentionally want to know the constitutional rights at this level and this early of an age, you're doing more than just characterizing something that, that's going to be good and useful during that grade level. You're actually giving them tools for life. I needed to applaud you for that because it's not common. Um, I believe that in my public school uh, joining, maybe I had three teachers that were that engaging, like that level of engaging out of 12 years, like three teachers, you know, so, so it's important to, to highlight that because children, and I mean youth, need to know that you care. Uh, and, and especially in time frames now where, you know, you spend eight hours a day in school, you're going to be around people more than you're around your parents. By the time you get home, you're really not around them, you know, and granted they're in the house. So you being a, um, a something that they could uh, look to and engage with in more of a fun and learn scenario. I applaud you for that. I really need to give you your flowers for it because it's not common. Um, and should, thank you. Should it go viral on TikTok? I mean, God bless. But what's more important to me is the impact that it actually is giving. So I wanted to thank you for that. I appreciate that. And you know, I'm glad you mentioned about with history and engagement. Most of the time, history is probably one of the most boring classes that you have in school. And I used to hate that because you either had a good history teacher or one that I could say sucked. And I remember being in high school, you know, I had some really good history teachers. There was some that were not good, but there was some that really were engaging. And I remember we had one who loved just to talk about history. And, you know, she did a whole segment on the Hall of Renaissance. And, you know, she told us about, we read Native Son, even when it was banned back in the day, you know, talking about banned books. Yeah. And so back in the day, everybody knew who Bigger Thomas was. And so that really inspired me to be a teacher because it wasn't until you mentioned it that most, a lot of history teachers are boring. And the things, like even dressing up and the costumes, being engaged in, you know, I've been doing that for years. I think the difference now and then is there wasn't no social media. So mm -hmm. where it's like, if, and I got students on here who I taught 20 years ago, they knew I dressed up. The difference was now you can post it and things that people can see. Mm -hmm. And so I'll do a lot of stuff too. And sometimes, you know, it's not even dressing up, but when you, get to students role playing stuff, then they find, you know, more interest in it. And the last one with the basketball shooting, those two boys on that team are from a state semifinal team on state championship last year. Mm -hmm. And so they made them long shots and you know, have our suit on. I said, listen, 
I'm gonna make my shot the first time. They don't, they, they would teach me how to use it, like with the editing and stuff. I said, listen, I'm gonna make this first shot and I'm gonna be good. And so they're like, Dr. Bond got a suit on and this. I said, I don't care. And so when they took their pics, they make the shot and gave it back. Then I took my shot and I said, it's like, oh shoot, he made it on one try. And so the comedy behind it, but the fact was that those students knew about the origin of the Supreme Court. Yeah. They knew how many people in the Supreme Court, you know. They also knew the first African American, you know, Thurgood Marshall also knew about the first female, Sharon J. O'Connor. And there's been a lot of demand and requests for another one. So we're probably gonna do another video this week. So I got requests from a few students and parents that they want another video. So that's just a blessing itself. But yeah. when you make history engaging, it's a great subject to teach. No, I agree. I actually think that history and art were my two favorite subjects. I agree that, you know, it isn't the most, you know, entertaining subject. But when you do understand it, like if you understand, and again, I think both of us generationally were from a time frame that history wasn't as filtered as it is right now in terms of the student curriculum. But prior, it's definitely gone through a little bit of whitewashing. In Texas, I actually signed a petition. This is where I am. I actually signed a petition about them removing and amending slavery in the U.S. history books because of what they were taking out of certain publications. And that's integral because if you don't have that information, then how are you understanding what happened? See, that now, now right. you have the ability to change said story instead of, well, we just want to include it. When I was a part of how the country was built, you should probably leave that in there, right? I mean, it, it's, not, it's not like it happened to another country or there was another atrocity in U.S. history shy of the trail of tears that should be as impactful in this particular segment. But yet they can learn about other atrocities in world history and those are okay. Mm -hmm. Now we got, right. we got to be fair and balanced, right? Um, so you making it, um, it, sticking with the constitution, you making it a part of the curriculum and sticking that in terms of a learned experience for the youth, I always thought was uh, very interesting. I liked history, but I also was, you know, a reader and, and a conversationalist, you know, and not everyone, mm -hmm. not everyone is. Um, so when you, when you, did, was history the only subject that you were teaching always? Well, you know what, when actually I taught in Florida, I actually was certified to teach science. So I taught science mm -hmm. for about eight years. And what was cool, I actually did a combo of like two hours class of one hour social studies, one hour science. And the great thing about that was you actually can incorporate science into history and vice versa. And so many times my lessons, you know, which they teach, you know, you want the lessons correlate. So many times my history lessons, I can mention something in science. I could mention how the plague, you know, killed a third of Europe, you know, and the science part with disease and stuff into European history. And in America, we could talk about, you know, before COVID, we talked about how the flu virus uh, after World War I, 1921, killed millions throughout the world. And so what I did, I incorporated both subs into it, and it, it, was, pretty, it was pretty fun to do. Yeah. But uh, for the last 11 years, it's been all history. Yeah. So when you, uh, where did you go to school and where did you graduate from to receive your doctorate in education? Right. Well, I went to uh, SUNY Westbury in Long Island, New York. Okay. And I got my, and that was okay, back, that's uh, here, 20, okay. two years ago. I'm Can sorry. You hear? Okay. The, um, the New York accent is what I'm hearing, right? Okay, yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, still have it. Okay. Still have it. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, when, when, when did you graduate? Oh, um, 1998. Okay, awesome. With my bachelor's. And I got my doctorate uh, just four years ago. So it's been kind of, it's been a blessing, been cool. And, um, you know, I major in religious history and also war history, so that was kind of cool. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, congratulations, then. That's still actually kind of fresh, but, you know, that, no, that's really good. Really good. So in terms of, in terms of education and, well, let me, let me pause on that. The next question that I would have is about the book. So mm -hmm. the book was written a year ago? Was that mm -hmm. right? Okay. Yes, a little over a year ago. And in its, in its complete arrangement, what you have in the book is that, A, you discuss and, and have the journal entries of the students um, in a various uh, group of students, you know, African-American, white, mixed. You have all of that, which I think is um, helpful in, in describing a variety of experiences and 
really reading through it, most of them are pretty streamlined in, in terms of all sharing the same experience, dealing with depression, dealing with anxiety, dealing with the obscurity of not knowing when school is ever going to come back to normal and the need for it to be normal because they're so used to being amongst each other. That's important. Um, then, of course, you go into uh, the killing of George Floyd and their feelings on that, um, as well as Breonna Taylor and their feelings towards that. Um, can we touch for a moment about, about George Floyd? What was, the, what was the experience with you being on ground uh, during the pandemic, teaching the youth while that's happening? Well, that year, the schools had closed down in March of 2020. And so that's when I had, I had students journal before, but I had them journaling, you know, more. And I told the students because school was closed. I said, if you want to journal, you know, text it to me, email it to me, just send it to me and I'll read them. And so I started reading many journals and honestly, I was amazed with what those scholars wrote. And I said to myself, let me see if I could, you know, find a publishing company to, you know, make a copy of it. And that's where the idea of it came you know, by being a book because, you know, I've always been journaling and I know it's a big social emotional learning tool for students mm -hmm. because, you know, reading the journal, you saw the anxiety, this change where, okay, there's no school now. Okay, there's no problem, no field trip, all is taken away. And so that's why I put that part. And just a couple of months later, when George Floyd, when that incident happened and people, black, white, Hispanic, they were moved by it. And you know, thankfully, somebody did record it because if there was no recording, who knows what might not have happened. You know, yeah. I remember back in the day, my first year of college with the Rodney King incident in 1992. And I remember people saw the video, but the first time the police were exonerated because it was just a little small videotape. Right. But when you have, uh, you know, the video of George Floyd and being on social media that millions all over the world saw, it really, you know, people saw it for what it was. And I had Stuart Percy who wrote journals about how they were falsely arrested and what they went through. And I experienced profiling myself mm -hmm. where I went through the same thing and I went to suit and tie. And so profiling is real. No, it just came on the forefront that there was a veil camera. Yeah. And one of the things my students know I, I fight for is I, I fight against racism. You know, uh, the black students, white students and, Mixed students, Spanish students, they know I fight for social justice for all. Mm -hmm. And when history is really taught right, you really, you really get it and understand it. And it's made you mention about like the things in the textbook. I remember when I was in high school, they still would put the three fifth compromise in the back of the social textbook. Mm -hmm. And my students who had me before, you know, they know I talk about three fifth compromise, and people don't like to talk about it. Yeah. But when you then they group of people and say they're free for some person. That tell you something because we can talk about Nazi Germany all we want. You know, people quit talk about Hitler and the Jews and this, that, but I got told my students, civics government class, where did Nazi Germany get a lot of the ideas of segregation from? They got from Jim Crow South. Yep. Yeah. You look if you look up, and now my students do this one day in class, you look up the Nuremberg Laws of 1935. The Nuremberg Laws in 1935 said the Jewish people are not citizens. They can't vote. They can't marry a German. And it really mirrors our law back then, Jim Crow. And we, uh, I have my government students, and I see some on the line. We studied the case Loving vs. Virginia, 1967. And they made a movie about it where the mixed couple, the white man and the black woman, were married. And they went to jail because of the laws of Virginia said they couldn't be married. And they went to jail yep. because they got married. And so it took a whole Supreme Court case over Turner's. So I told the students, I won't say don't hate the country, but know what mistakes were made. So it gives you to do better. Because one of the things Nazi Germany did, they saw the mistakes. They saw the things they did wrong. They saw the evil that they did, and they finally had to fess up to it. Mm. And even the countries that they did wrong, like France, England, when they went bankrupt after World War II, those same countries that they bombed and killed and destroyed, those same countries funded them when uh, World War II ended. So I tell you something. So Germany learned a lesson. Like Even though we treat these countries wrong, look at how they're helping us. Look at how they're going to bat for us, even though we treat them wrong. 
Sure. Now, so, now you have a you have a really interesting point with that. A really interesting point with that. I was in Germany in 2019, uh, and I walked through the city of Berlin, and I went to the monument of the murdered Jews of Europe, because it's clearly what Hitler did during that onslaught is that he took the lives of all of them, he stripped them from their homes, did all well, you know, did everything in the internment camps between Germany and Auschwitz. What's interesting about what I always explain, because, you know, if you get me to drink and coffee around my friends at brunch, by the way, a few of them are in here now. So, hey, Nina, Rod, Chris and you, TV, Brandon, what's going down? I appreciate y'all for joining. Danielle, I appreciate y'all. But when I get to talking about stuff like this, understanding that what we, what we as well as the world powers that got together decided to do to Germany in defense to bomb them into submission for World War II. It essentially required them in that treaty to atone for what they did to the Jews. They had to pay reparations, pause. They had to um, develop um, funding and other mechanisms financially and economically in order for them to actually get themselves, themselves royally back together within those areas. That's proven. We, by contrast, didn't do that. Now, we did bomb them, but we never contributed to the atonement, if we're going to use that word linear, to what happened within the black people, the African involuntary move migrated slaves in order for the country to be built. That's not a reparative, it's not a reparations-based conversation. It's about a couple of things that they tried to do in order to make it even. I think they've probably used the idea that there's too many numbers to try to facilitate what would be equatable to reparations. But the Germans did it. And they, as you said, they went bankrupt. And clearly, Germany doesn't have enough or as much money as the United States does. However, they did take loans from everyone else in order to bring themselves back together. Ironically enough, they just cut, they uh, bought out the debt of Spain. Who knew that was going to happen? Um, but right. But ideally, no, I, I completely understand it because these things spark my interest as well. That monument takes up a city block. You can walk through it. It's literally houses. They're all in gray slate uh, stone. And you can walk up and down the corridors. It's just immense, representing all of the buildings that the Jews were ripped from during that onslaught. We don't have a single thing representative of that at that magnitude. Like not, not anywhere in the country. Now, we do have the African-American uh, uh, History Museum, which are beautiful, um, but not, not equally uh, the same. Right. And, and I think what that does, that leads to sometimes frustration mm. in America. Because then what happens when it has not been like an atonement, and then you see like a George Floyd incident or the instance, that's where I think frustration comes in because of you see when Nazi Germany did apologize for the things and the evils. And you say, well, America kind of some same thing. And you remember now in 1946 at the Nuremberg trials, there were no trials for um, the evils that were done in the civil rights movement of things. No, they weren't. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes that caused frustration as well. And, you know, when we have these conversations in class, they're not easy conversations to have. Okay. The best thing I do, you know, is, you know, I'm 100 with them. I'm going to tell them, yeah, this, this is some frustration. And not putting blame on the people now, but it's also good to know what happened and never forget, you know, your past. Uh, recently, I got a position for the North Carolina Council of Social Studies, and I'm on the board of directors. And I, it's an honor for me because I know my ancestors on my dad's side, not just three generations ago, were slaves. Mm. In was North Carolina. I, I've done the whole history on it. And matter of fact, when I did the history, I found out I had some family members I didn't even know I was related to because of it. So I could just trace it three generations ago with slaves. And so it's not that long ago when these things happened. And so when I did the book, Perseverance of Strange Land, one of the things I figured was that especially in the future, people will see how kids felt like when things are now getting more normal now. You know, when kids are going to school, they're all having social events. You know, we had a prom for the high schools. We had different events. And so now graduation, you can go to it. I was in virtual. But, you know, even now, even years ago, later, people say, wow, what was it like when there was a pandemic? Yeah. And now people say, what was it like when the joy for them was going on? What were people thinking? What was their reaction? Because 
in some people view, it wasn't about black or white. It was just the fact that something wrong was done. You know, something, race may be involved, but also mm -hmm. the fact <clears throat> he should not have died. And so that's the other perspective we look at. And um, the other part of the book, which I really like, is I put little biographies of different civil rights leaders. And yes, I mentioned you know, people like Martin Luther King that people know about, but I also mentioned those who are unsung. Like uh, one of the things I told my students, I incorporate a lot of women's history. I made sure there's a biography of Shirley Chisholm because most people realize Shirley Chisholm was the first woman to run for president. You know, before there was a Kamala Harris, there was a Shirley Chisholm. And my mom actually met Shirley Chisholm a couple of times in Brooklyn. And so when I had the opportunity to put little biographies in my book, I made sure it was people that, you know, you may not always hear about in history books. I put down Eleanor Roosevelt, yeah. where when Franklin Roosevelt was sick, pretty much for a couple of years, she ran the country. The executive orders and things of that nature, she took care of it because FDR was sick for years. And you know the history, he died before World War II ends. He dies April 12, 1945. World War I goes off another you know, four months. But, for, but before Truman became president, Eleanor Roosevelt was doing a lot of the executive work as a leader. And so I made sure that there were several people in my book mm -hmm. that were the unsung and in some ways forgotten. Yeah, I think you did a lot of variety in terms of the, um, the amount of quotes uh, and the amount of people that you use in the clubs. It wasn't just black people, it was white, um, it wasn't just men, it was women. I think there was a lot of equal contributions, which I think is really good because the way that, the way that I appreciate your approach in particular is that you've provided enough variety that you can understand from a very unilateral perspective that inspiration can come from all sides from the sake of the what is going to push society, America, the institutions, what's going to produce better people moving forward doesn't just have to come from your local teacher, but it can come from those who inspired him. You have President Obama, you had another president, I can't remember who that was. It wasn't Reagan. I can't remember who it was. Um, was you had another president uh, quoted in the book as well. I can't remember who it was. Oh, yes. John, I had candy quotes as well. I, I love candy quotes. Yeah. Yeah. Kennedy quotes. Yeah. I saw I saw um, where you had um, the astronaut, the female astronaut that that was on Endeavor. You know, mm -hmm. I'm looking at all because this is this is our generation. So when I'm looking at right. it, I'm like, I remember her. I thought I thought it was, right. it, it was so refreshing to see how you outline the book because it wasn't you know it's not just journal entries which is really helpful and because it, it allows for people to understand perspective but you also had when a, a very horrible situation happens now you have a response from them then you have the inspirational quotes that should keep you structured and help hopefully moving forward with or without these unfortunate and unforeseen circumstances then there's a activity section at the end of that. So you have, um, you know, word puzzles, journal, uh, 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 open note section, as well as, is that a coloring section? Is that what that was? Yes. Now, okay. there, was diff there was two parts. What there was, there was a uh, word search part. And especially during the pandemic when many people were bored to use in the house, you know, you think about it, a lot of places were closed, you know, even, you know, talk about normalcies, the normalcy of getting a haircut. <laughs> And yeah. I may not have as much of the hair as I used to, but get your hair cut. The social environment, going to the barber shop, talking to your barber, just chilling, hanging out. Yeah. That was gone. And I remember my face getting all scruffy and, and looking like Grizzly Adam. And you know, you're like, man. So I put that in as well, but I also put a few extra pages where along with the drawing, but also where students or adults could journal like what were they feeling during this time because you know, there were some people that said, Well, I want to write how I feel. And so I know some adults that told me that they sell, told me they dealt with like depression and other things. And they were able to write in the back of the book, you know, some of the things that they felt, some of the anxiety they were feeling. Mm -hmm. And because when I found out a lot of educators were feeling just like the students, they were nervous, they were anxious, they were fearful of things. And then when you try to come back and teach the normal way, sometimes and I've learned this, and I tell some people, you can't always teach the old way. You know, back in our day, and I'm 48, you know, back in our day, the teacher could teach for 45, 50 minutes and say, 
the trial of 1962, and just be point to be. And if you move once, you flinch. You got detention. Uh, I, but you can't teach like that anymore. You have to let students get up. You let have to let them mingle. You have to let them bend. And so a lot of the activities, you know, even now, it involves moving around, walking. Even I had students uh, for my American History 2 class, there's a segment I do when it comes to like the 70s and 80s and 90s. I, I incorporate a music part where, you know, I had them hear Marvin Gaye, what's going on? Because, you know, he talked about the environment, the ecology, think about something. You had a, a singer sing about the environment, about injustice. Adam let, Adam let them hear Stevie Wonder mm -hmm. sing his song, Inner City Blues. I had him hear him, uh, Marvin Gaye, uh, makes you want to holler. And it's funny because most of the younger kids, their parents don't Marvin Gaye and the other songs don't like, let's get it on. But, yeah. <laughs> but they knew and heard them all. And they realized that people back then, even Bob Dylan wrote songs about what was going on. Bob Dylan wrote a song when Mecca Evans was assassinated. And I did yeah. my uh, bachelor's thesis on Mecca Evans. And here he was, Bob Dylan, the white guy, he saw social injustice. He said, Meg Evans was murdered and something needed to be done. And so I also incorporate music involved in uh, one of my favorite groups of all time, Public Enemy, which is one of my favorite groups. They also, um, they followed me as well. And they brought my book and Chuck D has brought my book and uh, cool. Professor Griff has a copy. And so it's awesome because, you know, I remember, you know, 1989, I was a freshman high school. I'm here and fight the power for the first time. Yeah. And I was like, wow, we got to fight the power, says B. And it inspired me today. So I also incorporate music in my lessons as well. And like I said, you know. How far back do you go in the music? Because, you know, when you, when you think about, when you think about popular American music, not pop music, but popular American music at the time frame. Um, and those are really good examples. So like Bob Dylan was a, a very famous folk singer and he even wrote uh, a song about Hurricane Carter when he was wrongfully in prison. Um, right. But they, they have, um, who was it? Crosby? St no, 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 no. Who's the one who sings Sweet Home Alabama? Oh, Linda Skinner. So Linda Skinner makes Sweet Home Alabama, though everyone plays it at every single bar in Texas that I go to, and I wish they stopped because A, mm -hmm. in Alabama, and then B, they don't really understand, or maybe they do because I'm in Texas, that they don't seem mm -hmm. to understand that that is about the rebel flag, which is a battle flag, but it's a battle flag for the Confederacy being flown, and they still wanted to keep it flown. That's what that song effectively is about. But mm -hmm. um, there was another artist that came out which may have been the first disc record when they were going back and forth about each other, and that was called Southern Man. And that song mm -hmm. was the counterbalance of Sweet Home Alabama. And, right. I, and I just love the idea that even these two white rock artists were still going back and forth about a policy that had everything to do with slaves and everything to do with civil rights at the time. So Sweet Home Alabama wins the most spins that you can get for any album, but it has less impact than Southern Man, which was about people keeping a civil mind about the rights of black people at the time. But right. nobody talks about it. Nobody talks about that. Most don't. And I'm glad because most don't know the history of especially that song, Sweet Home Alabama. Just like, you know, even some of the songs, we think about some of the songs James Brown did. Mm. And most people don't get it. You know, people love Stevie Wonder, but, you know, made the songs that he saying you're like wait oh yeah that's that's a message i mean i had played pastime paradise with stevie wonder mm -hmm. and here stevie's singing about mutilation yep. incarceration mm -hmm. anticipation of the evils of the world and this is in the 1970s yep and so i let some of my class watch i said look how profound it is back then and even now so i said sometimes you gotta look at the lyric yep. because he was singing about it back then, and it's still an issue today. And so, like I said before, you know, I believe in fighting for social justice, and um, that's I'm big when it comes to fighting for women's rights because it's needed, it's necessary, and for all rights, for space for minorities. Because, like I said before, um, one thing, and I believe my students will say this: I don't judge, I don't stereotype a student. In other words. 
If you're my AP class, black, white, whatever, I'm going to treat you the same way. <laughs> In other words, you're going to learn to do the essays or the work, but I'm not going to show a bias. The only doing the work is need to do, you know, be fine. And one of the great things with doing the videos I did recently, it was black, white, was Hispanic, and the great thing were the kids were excited about it. Hmm. Like, we did the one with the branch of the government, and, like, because they had to teach me how to use TikTok. I didn't know. I didn't know you could put the eye kind of. So I'm like, wait, you're talking about the branch of the government, not those branches. And so you had a couple of my students going up, and, and they know about the branch of the government, how it functions, how it works. And then there was another one, uh, the Slap Your Teacher, which we saw a video where a kid was slapping the teacher. I'm like, first of all, this is wrong. And secondly, I said, yeah. nobody better ever try to slap me. And it's great we have a poor student because like some of my friends in New York and other areas saw it and they was like, Steve, them kids really love it because in some schools you do try to do a prank like that, somebody would try to slap me for real. Yeah. But to do a skill like that and I could trust those in my class and say, okay, this kid guy's going to slap me, but he's not going to. And, you know, I said, what in the world? And the funniest thing, many times students would come up to me in the hallway and I see someone, <laughs> I see someone alive right now. Someone come up to me and just say, Dr. Bond, say yes. Say, what in the world? And I had a parent during the graduation ceremony. It was like, Dr. Bond. I said, yes. They said, what in the world? So it became kind of famous. But what it also let you know was that they remember, because one time I was been a test, and it was on the Supreme Court cases. And before the test, I said, uh, remember that video we made a month and a half ago? Oh, yeah. We talked about Marbury Massive. We talked about Plessy and Ferguson. Yeah. We talked about Love and Virginia. So it's a tool where they remember it as well. And so, like I said, um, and I that they have fun doing it, and so did I. And many times teachers have to get out the box. Yeah, I agree with you. I think the one that, the one that really made me, um, I think when we really started our conversation, what really took notice to me uh, is when you sent the crate challenge one. And because you step, and because because it was so many students that actually chimed in afterwards, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'll tell you what. For those that are listening, and, and granted, you know, your students and former students are there, so they they've been following you. For those who aren't familiar with the way that Dr. Bond actually does these TikTok videos, you need to go over to his TikTok, go to his Instagram page, check the IG page because the TikToks are on there as well because we can duplicate. But you need to see these because they are pretty funny. Um, and, and it is, it's intellectually stimulating, but it's also refreshing when you look at what the students are doing in, involved with his orchestration. That's something that, that's impactful because I get, I get really giddy when I start to look at what teachers are doing and, and how the educational system or how you are working around in some, it's probably not the right way to say it, but how you're working around the restrictions of the educational system because of the standardized level of, of curriculum that you have to teach. But then there's also things that you are teaching outside of that. Um, so again, that, that's something that I appreciate as far as your approach, uh, because this is, is very different, but it's also very now. One of the things, and I see several other uh, people on, one of the things that with the TikTok and the other videos I did, which I liked was, I let the students lead. You know, when we talk about social emotional learning, and I did a workshop on it a few times. Social emotional learning is a good way where they, you let the students lead. So in words, when the videos are done, I may give a little script and say, do this. But if they'll say, well, Dr. Bond, why don't we try this or do it this way? We can add this icon. I'm like, shoot, you know this better than I do, so go for it. So when you watch them, it's their work. And as educators, what we're really supposed to do, we're supposed to lead and then let them lead for themselves. So, you know, after we did the videos, I said, okay, you deserve an Oscar for just your production of this video. And mm -hmm. the last one we did with the basketball, we had a young lady at our school. She, did, she directed the whole video, told us where to be. She said, okay, well, you shoot here. The other students shoot here. Dr. Bond, you shoot here. And we did that. I said, okay, you're right. You know it's better than me. And so with that social emotional learning piece, when you let students lead, they become leaders not just in the classroom, but also in the future. Because what you really are doing, and I don't think they see it sometimes, you're empowering them. I let them know. I said, listen, I see in the hallway, I said, you deserve an Oscar for the way you directed that video. You almost slapped me in the video. You deserve an Oscar because you did a good job of pulling back. I mean, he could laugh at now, but I was like, 
oh shoot, he can't. I'm like, you can't. I said, you came this close, though, was slapping me. And so there's always a joke in it when it's done. You know, even the one with the the first one with the crate, because I'm from the hood, born in Queens, New York. And by, by the way, Bobby, what's up? How you doing? And my student from Wilson Prep, how you doing? And I'm from Queens, so in the hood, we use milk crates. We didn't use it for stepping on. We used it for we cut a hole in it, you know, get a That's nail or something. And we played basketball with. We played hoops. That was that was hoop in the hood. I mean, that's how I was back then. <laughs> so yeah. when I'm looking at these girls, I'm like, okay, this person just fell on a crate. They tried to sit, step on each crate and was falling. I said, this is dumb stuff. So I said, you know what? I said, Lord, it would be a cool idea if I act like I was going to do the, the crate challenge. But having to do the preamble challenge because what I do, I do some different games with my students where I'll do like gift cards. So any scholar who can recite the whole preamble of the Constitution, mm -hmm. I'll give them like a gift card or whatever or essay conscious, things like that. So they already knew. So I said, along with the challenge, let's put this in as a segue just to add a different twist to it because what it does, it like adds a sense of humor to it. And what it does, it motivates the students even more. And I remember the young man who recited the whole preamble, you know, he was confident. He had a little swag. He was like, you know, be the people of the United States. And he said it with such clarity and such emphasis. And so people were just amazed by it. So the activities I do is for them. Even the book, and I tell them often, I said, listen, this is not my book. This is your book. This is your yeah. voice. This is your words, you know, being said. You know, you're going through the hurt. You're going through the pain. You were falsely arrested. Because Paul, your dad was arrested before and now, and being stereotyped. So it speaks more to the voice of the young people. And like I said before, as teachers, we owe it to them. We're supposed to make it fun. And like I said, when you laugh at the kids, because first of all, kids know when the teacher enjoys them. If they're not, if they're miserable, they're going to say, that. that teacher don't care about it. He lame. He annoying. But they say, well, you know, Bond, we understand Bond. We know Bond. And uh, I, I got observed um, by my principal about a month and a half ago. And he was in my 10th grade civics class. And the young man, and I'll say his name's Cody. I don't know if he's here right now. He went up to him and told him, like, all, like, the first 10 minutes of the Constitution. And the principal was like, okay, is this kid in your AP college government class? I said, no, he's in 10th grade. He was like, wow. So we can tap in and keep the interest. And still have learning at the same time, you know, it's an awesome thing because what it also does, those kids who dealt with depression, dealt with anxiety, dealt with hurt. And I've seen, I know, I know the stories where students stay in the room later and say, Bond, I'm going through, I've had a hard time. You know, my parent passed and this is tough. And I have one student say, he was like, Bond, I, I understand what you went through. I said, no, I said, you talked to me. Because when my dad died. I was 46 and crap. I said, you're just 17. So I said, you're strong in me because you finished in high school and graduated this year after losing your dad, after doing that pain. So I said, you were strong. I said, you can go overcome this. I said, there's nothing in this world you can't overcome. Yeah. And when you level with them like that, when you level with them like that, it means so much to me. Like, wow, this person cares. Yeah. And those relationships that you build, it's awesome, and I'm just honored because I see so many people from my high school. Uh, another colleague who I used to work, co-work with, um, Mr. Jordan, what's up? Um, it's just an honor just to be able to talk to other educators. And so I'm truly blessed with, you know, just yeah. the book and trying to help educate the best I can. No, no I, I appreciate it. I have a lot of um, constituencies, actually, since I started this platform that – uh, we share a lot more ideas, but I've been involved in, you know, education throughout my own experience as well, speaking with educators for quite some time. It's always refreshing when I can have someone of a similar mindset um, and similar experiences uh, understandably go through the conversation with them because it's kind of like two matching minds and you just bounce off each other. It makes for everything a little bit more natural when you're speaking um, and, and, and having the conversation in general. Your your ideas are are classic, but your approach is fresh to me um, and new. Like I said, I hadn't seen anything like it. And the fact that you had your students posted on TikTok, I thought that would be helpful. Because to be honest with you, 
you know, education in terms of a hot topic item isn't going to hit the top of the charts. It, it takes something, you know, viral in order for it to be pushed up to the very, very top. And and quite honestly, I don't look at what you're doing as comedic. I think what you're doing is interesting because the end product is that you have hundreds of students who actually understand the Constitution. Because a black child or a child of color that understands the Constitution, even when you're just going through it in a class, it's going to stay with them. And if it stays with them, then they will know how it applies to them. If they know how it applies to them, then they can have it less used against them. And that's really where I found the value in what you were doing, because it's not funny to me. It's entertaining, but it's not funny. Um, and right. and I, I would hope that people understand it in that context, because I know you and I get it. Um, but it, it, it is something that is important. There's value in what you did, sir. I, like I said, I, I really we were overdue for the conversation, but I really wanted to have it with you um, mm -hmm. because um, it's it's a very important one for what you did. Um, let's um, let's close so that we can have our our individuals enjoy the rest of their evening and get some dinner time. But um, so let let me go with a few thanks, and then you can also do a few thanks. Um, number one, thank you for being a part of this and making time this evening. Um, thank you for writing this book. Um, you can let everyone know where to find it as well. Thank you for sending it to me because I was going to buy it, but it was like the next day you just sent it over to me. Um, but it, it's a good read, and I will share it. Um, for everybody from, from my side that came in, Whitney, Ray, Nina, Roderick, Prison Youth Ministries, Brandon Gillespie, everyone that joined in, I appreciate y'all. Thank you. I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Bond so he can send his thanks as well as like. Before that, sir, uh, my condolences to you for your father as well as your sister, because uh, I think we talked before, and I know what that's like as well, um, but my heart goes out to you. I, I appreciate it. Thank you, because it was a tough time. Like I said before, you know, I lost a twin sister and my dad around a three-month span. Both was not COVID, but, you know, it still, you know, hurt just as much. And you know, as I close, I want to thank everybody who came on, former students, present students, uh, educators who I know, uh, Bobby from Liberation Lab, and uh, Mr. Jordan, where I worked for a couple of years in uh, Kissimmee, Florida, uh, actually Lake County, Florida, and we had we had a great time. And so anyone else I miss, you know, I'm sorry. And, and those in the UK who are also on, I appreciate you staying up this late, you know, hearing it. And so I'm blessed. As, you know, we close, you know, history is a subject I love to teach. And I really believe that when you tell the whole story, the good and the bad, you make it more relevant because nowhere you leave the bad stuff out, people will say, well, you left out a major part and you told and you lied and steve with the story. So you want to mention the good part. You want to mention a good part about the country. You also want to mention the bad part. And it makes a better environment when you can admit good things happen. Well, can admit what happened because all I got to do is research it because here's what happens. You look and say, oh, wow. Tulsa race riot massacre that happened. I didn't learn that. I learned about what happened in Philadelphia when they when they bombed Philadelphia. I learned about the Rosewood riot. Uh, yep. Even with whites, I didn't know about the Kent State shooting where they killed four white students. So it's not always black or white. But yeah. when you try to hide that history, that's when people are like that's when people get upset. It's like wait, so the country did this? The country spied on us? Uh, they gave people vaccinations with uh, with with STD. This really happened, and yeah. so when you find out, and sometimes like when people in my class, first time, there's like a shock, right? Because the things he would not talk for. They was like, "What do you mean that?" This has actually been a really good episode, a really good episode, um, and very consistent with the brand. So for those who haven't been a part of the podcast or seeing uh, much of the variety of what we do. You can always check into that on YouTube as well as on any other streaming platforms. It's under Qualified or Q-L-A-F-D as a shortened name, uh, the podcast. Um, not too hard to find. You can always check my Instagram page as well. This episode will be airing uh, soon. We're just going to cut out the dead spots and put it out to the streaming platforms. So you will be notified accordingly uh, once this actually comes out. But feel free to subscribe to my page. I'm always interested in having new people. You can check the variety as it comes. All right, guys. Well, listen, thank you for joining. Thank everyone for joining. I'm going to go ahead and end the live stream now. This will be posted on the streaming platform soon. It'll be on Instagram anyway. You can see the page in, in case anyone wants to replay it. But thank you, guys. Be well. Be well to each other.
qualify the podcast. Dr. Bond, thank you very much. Bye-bye.